So on today's Coding Secrets, I thought I would break down exactly how complicated it was to code Sonic R on the Sega Saturn. I loved coding on the Saturn, as it was really rewarding putting in the effort and thinking outside of the box, but to maximise what you could do, you really had to use every part of the hardware. Here's a look at the main motherboard for the Saturn. There were various revisions made to its life, but this one will do as an example. Let's look at what the main chips do exactly. There is a Hitachi SH1 chip here, along with the CD input-output chip that together handle reading data from the CD drive. And down here, we have the DRAM, which is the main RAM for the system, the SRAM, or static RAM, which holds onto data even when the machine is turned off, useful for keeping hold of the time and date, and of course save games, and also a DRAM control chip. Lower down, there's a chip with the BIOS stored on it, a video RAM chip, and the SMPC, or System Manager and Peripheral Control chip. Then come the Yamaha Custom Sound chip and a 68000 chip dedicated to running the sound and music. It's highly likely that the 68000 was used to enable the possibility of backwards compatibility with the Sega Genesis, but that never actually became possible. Next we have the Visual Display Processors, or VDP, 1 and 2. These handle all the drawing of the graphics. Then there are the twin Hitachi SH2 processors. These are the main CPUs and are identical chips. And finally we have the SCU, or System Control Unit. This is needed to manage all the data passing between all these different chips. The SCU also contains a powerful Digital Signal Processing chip, or DSP, which is a nightmare to program for, but allows extremely fast matrix operations, which vastly speed up the 3D graphics if you can utilize it correctly. So how on earth do you juggle this lot to get the best performance for a game like Sonic R? Well, I'll tell you exactly what I had to do. Let's just concentrate on the five chips that produce the gameplay and graphics. They are the twin CPUs, VDP 1 and 2, and the DSP inside the SCU. Firstly, I actually ran all of the game logic, movement, terrain mapping, AI, pickups, power-ups, animation, and so on, all on the servant CPU. This also processed all the 3D calculations and set up all the polygons and lighting to draw the main characters, the rings, particle effects, and so on. The game logic was programmed in C, here's what that looks like, and the time-critical 3D processing was coded in assembler, like this. Then all the 3D polygons produced were stored at the top of video memory, and they would then be fetched and drawn on VDP1. This CPU also set up and processed the rippling water effect, which is drawn using a background layer on VDP2, as well as animating textures and any track-specific effects needed. It then also set up and processed the 3D background layer that was used for the floor underneath the polygons in a track, and also handled by VDP2. All this meant that the main CPU was free to calculate and process the track and all the objects around the track. This made up the vast majority of the polygons drawn in the game. A small amount of code was written in C for this process, but most of it was in assembler. Any 3D polygons produced were stored in the bottom end of video memory to keep them away from any being produced by the servant CPU. Both CPUs trying to access the same memory at the same time would be a nightmare, so I kept them well away from each other and then linked all the polygons together at the end when I did a final Z sort on them using the main CPU. Unlike the other CPU, which did all the 3D calculations for any polygons produced by itself, as the main CPU was dealing with many times more polygons, I used the DSP to speed up all the 3D matrix operations. The DSP code looked like this. As you can see, it's extremely complicated, as the DSP was capable of executing six instructions simultaneously, and so you had to write code in a very careful way, so that the right instructions were operating on the correct registers at the right time. Let me know if you want to see a video on exactly how this code works. So the main CPU, in parallel with the DSP, crunched through all the track location geometry and then combined it with the polygons produced by the servant CPU at the same time, and finally VDP1 rendered them to the frame buffer. Well, actually VDP1 would be rendering the last frame's polygons at the same time as this frame's polygons were being set up, so that it could all happen in parallel. Finally, the main CPU would also set up the HUD icons and user lap time elements using VDP2. Once this was all completed, all the various layers were combined together to produce the final screen image. And that's a quick explanation of how all the various chips on the Sega Saturn were used together to create Sonic R. If you enjoy this kind of video, I have lots more on this channel, so please consider subscribing and clicking on the notification bell so you don't miss any new ones. And please leave a like if you want to see more. Until next time, goodbye.